cool of bottling works on pine. Kind of. Yeah. Growing up, I, I lived in a, in a house on Lily Street, directly across from the Coke plant. Well, that's what we call it, the Coke plant. But the name on the, on the building is the Coca-Cola Bottling Works. But we call it the Coke plant. And um, this story takes place at about the time of Oh, it's 1970. And the character is about the age I would have been, the main character, at that time. So, this, uh, like Paula, works go through revisions. And the, the greatest revision this work has seen is the title. I, I usually just call it Coca Cola because it's, that's what it's about. It, it, I've also had it called Salvation by Works, but that's, that's part of writing. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what works? What clicks? Calvin Washington's orientation to the Coca-Cola bottling works began in front of a 10-foot tall replica of a Coke bottle that rotated on a transparent base. A mish mishmash of rods, gears, cogs, and belts wrapped around each other, turning a shaft that protruded through the base and conveyed motion to the bottle. Tilted slightly, perhaps to suggest potential flow, the bottle dwarfed the dozen grade school children who surrounded it, a sparkling contrast to their dirty faces, scraped knees, and worn clothing. Art Ferentz, the 48-year-old warehouse manager dressed in a pressed gray uniform that included his first name sewn in red over his right breast and a red trademark Coca-Cola patch over his left, met Calvin with a frown. Let's head to the shop and get to work, he said roughly. As Ferentz turned, a freckled, red-haired girl stuck her tongue out. The two men passed through the employees-only door at the rear of the lobby and headed toward another door at the end of a 70-foot hallway. Greedy little wretches, Ferens muttered. Whatever you say, Calvin thought. He felt an urge to shove his hands into his pockets, but Ferens fit pace wouldn't allow it. Who are they? he asked. Leeches from the neighborhood, looking for handouts. They get a six-pack of eight-ounce product. That's coke every time they take the tour. Calvin's grin didn't escape his boss. Don't encourage him, he said. It's not good business, it's charity. Hell, we could give him an empty bottle and we'd still keep their business. Everybody drinks Coke, but they think this place exists for them. Bad business. Bad business, Calvin thought, giving to beggars. He became conscious of a faint ringing as they proceeded and glanced at the keys dangling from Ferenc's belt. Nearly halfway down the hallway, Calvin realized the sound was glass being struck, the tinkling permeating cinder block, mortar, and paint echoing in the chamber that led to his first paid job. He'd envisioned his employment at the bottling works as temporary, a stopover to more interesting, fulfilling, better paying, and cleaner work. At 18, he accepted the job as salvage clerk with a gusto typical of any 18-year-old in it for the money. The pay wasn't bad either, especially for a stay-at-home college freshman in 1970. 274 an hour, 35 hours a week, plus all the, all the cold drinks he could swallow while on the job. The flip side of being a salvage clerk included working alone, risking injury, minor cuts, contusion, and insect bites or stings, and meeting a quota, or as Ferenc put it, being productive. They don't call this the bottling works for nothing, kid. Works what's expected of you. Lots of work. Take a look at that, for starters. Ferenc had opened the door at the hallway's end and revealed the warehouse, an open space that occupied nearly a block and a half. To his right, Three massive overhead doors, two of which stood open, provided Calvin a glimpse of the afternoon sunlight falling on the beaten down houses, sidewalks, and lawns of the Lily Street neighborhood. To the left, forklifts whizzed in any number of directions, most carrying cases of full or empty bottles stacked on skids that rose a foot or two higher than the lift trucks themselves. 
The vehicles passed in and out of cavernous openings created by the placement of 20-foot tall metal shelving units arranged like jetties on a beach. Calvin could make little sense of what he saw, but he looked at but when he looked at Ference and noted his broad smile, he assumed the frenetic pace matched the predetermined design. Calvin sighed. I'm a part of this now, a part of the process. Over here, kid, Ference called. He pointed toward the farthest end of the warehouse to a pile of bottles, wooden cases, and trash that measured two or three hundred cubic feet. To the right of the pile sat a dozen stacks of palletized empty bottles, and to the pile's left were a half dozen metal waste bins on wheels. As they walked through the warehouse, Ference explained Calvin's job in simple terms, recover reusable bottles and cases. The bottles to the right are what drivers bring back from stores and shops that have taken them for deposit, Ference began. Just sort and create them by type. Don't quibble over a case that's missing a chunk of wood or splintered in a couple of places. They're okay. But watch what glass you pass. No chips or cracks. If they're buggy or caped in muck, they're okay. But we can't use them if they're broken. And there's no sense cleaning them if we can't use them. Ference pointed to the pile of trash in front of them. Same goes for this heap. If it's worth saving, create it. If not, just chuck it over there. Ferenc tossed a chart of what had once been a fresca bottle into one of the large metal bins, the sign above which read green. Calvin winced, expecting to hear the glass break and shatter when it hit, but the only sound that came was a tinny chink. You'll learn the sound, Ferenc said. That bin's about two-thirds full. When it's full, fork it over to the staging area, over there. Ferenc pointed fleeting, fleetingly to the other end of the building, to a spot Calvin didn't see, but nodded in the direction of anyway. Mind, there's a bin for different colored glass. Sprite and Fresca go green. Tab, Fanta, and Dr. Pepper go clear. Coke's got its own. Don't mix them or you sort them. Or else, Calvin nodded. Good product sorted here, Ferenc said as he turned and point, pointed to a set of pallets behind him. Case the salvage lot. Good product on this side, glass and material over there. Don't mix them or use sort of questions. Calvin turned again toward the trash heap, noting the flies and yellow jackets, and for the first time catching an unfamiliar aroma of something organic. I don't think so, he replied. Good. Less you think, better you work. Let it come natural, second nature. Be sure you use your gloves, though. You got gloves, right? Calvin confessed that he'd left them in the lobby. Don't do you much good there, kid. Better get them before it gets busy. Driver will be back, coming back any minute now, and the place fills up fast. You'll get your uniform by week's end. Till then, be sure to use an apron or you'll fuck up your clothes. I leave at five. Frank Silver's your supervisor after that. Calvin worked after classes from three until eight, seven days a week. He would have preferred to take a day off, but after his first day on the job, he realized how slight that chance would be. Ferenc escorted him to the salvage area on the second day, much like he'd done on the first. What the hell you call this, kid? Calvin blinked at the ten cases of assorted product and material he'd salvaged the previous day, confident until that moment that he'd done what had been expected of him. This here's the bottle and works, son. Works. I expect two skids loaded per shift. That's 48 cases. It's the only way to stay, to stay ahead of that. Ferens pointed to the, at the stacks of bottles, bottle returns that had increased by two more rows since the day before. Even the trash heaps grown. A driver lost per near half a load this morning because he left his doors open for some reason. Don't let it get to you, though. It won't always be like this, but it can. So pick up the pace. Be the, be the clerk we know you can be. Who knows? You might get good and have that pile down to nothing if you put your back to it. As Ferenc spoke, Calvin initially wanted to ask what happened to the driver, but Ferenc's hesitancy at identifying his title fashioned a thought in Calvin's mind that 
his supervisor saw him as the salvage boy rather than the salvage clerk. And he wondered, he wondered if Ferenc meant to be encouraging rather than belittling. After all, Calvin thought, I'm a college student now, an adult, bettering myself, using my mind. Calvin nodded to Ferenc, who had already turned his back and headed toward another corner of the warehouse, shouting instructions as he went. The pivotal motion of his head moving up and down was an unconscious act on Calvin's part, though. And as he turned to begin his labor, Calvin considered his dream of becoming a marine biologist, a marine biologist from the Midwest. Was it merely striking against convention or against someone? And if so, was he willing to stand out? How committed to science was he? That day, with such questions coursing randomly in his mind, Calvin filled two skids, working until nearly midnight. Frank Silva had reminded him to clock out at his scheduled time, and Calvin had run to comply, then ran back to continue the salvage mission. He felt the lost pay, but he also began to enjoy the task, viewing it, viewing it as a competition of sorts key against the pile and stacks of bottles. He had no other plan than a raw attack, and once he'd gotten his aim down, tossing three or four pieces of glass at a time into a bin raised his efficiency remarkably. He had created his adversary. By the end of his second week, Calvin had upped his performance to 40 cases in five hours, close enough to Ferenc's expectations that he no longer felt shamed by his boss's complaints. The stacks began to dwindle, and the pile to slowly shrink. Well, that's progress, at least, Farron said when he brought Calvin his first paycheck. Calvin was on a high. Having scored a 91 on his biology midterm, he felt confident of his place at the university, not to mention his understanding of xylem and phloem. Also during the midterm week, the bodily works experienced three days of zero accidents, loss, or breakage. In the previous 50 years, such a circumstance had occurred only a dozen times. What it meant to Calvin was the glimmer of a possibility for completely eliminating the pile of discarded material. By 8 o'clock the second day, Calvin had cleared the return stacks and learned how close he was to finishing off the trash heap when Frank Silva came by to remind him to clock out and had pointed to a bright red mark on the brick wall behind the pile. That's four feet, kid, he said. I ain't never seen that in over three years. What is it? Calvin asked. That's the Coca-Cola logo. When it's all uncovered, which I've never seen. It's four feet to the floor from there. Calvin had considered leaving it uh, on time that night, but Silva's identification of the mysterious lost logo changed his plan. I've got to see this, he thought as he made his way to the time clock. They've got to see it. Someone will take a picture of me standing next to it, and they'll put it on the, in the company newspaper. Mr. Ferens will be in the picture, too, and he'll say, Calvin's relentless, unselfish work made this possible. His dedication is now a model for all of us to follow. I'll get a promotion and get out of this mess and train somebody else to meet my standard. You're walking too much. Do a minimal sort first. Work on your aim. Wipe down that good product. Stack those cases straighter or you'll be cleaning a fresh mess. You just toss coke in the green bin. Don't mix them or you sort them. Calvin returned and plunged into the pile. He worked an additional two hours that night, long enough to expose nearly half of the logo. The red mark on the wall became a glaring red semicircle against the faded orange brick. And the top half of the script C's and the and the L brilliantly contrasted with the brown, gray, and olive trash that surrounded it, like a sunrise. I can do this, Calvin said, so long as nobody else messes up. As Calvin clocked in the next afternoon, he envisioned the sunrise logo obliterated by a fresh lot of trash. Walking through the warehouse, he sensed the works moving at a heightened tempo, conveyors humming their light mechanical tones, bottles clinking in steady random succession, and forklifts blasting in acceleration, 
or rapid firing in transit to and from garage or production line, tires squealing on turns or stops, horns blaring, bells announcing the commencement or completion of tasks. The works at work. But to Calvin, the perceived pace meant a greater likelihood of accident or failure, and he unconsciously increased his pace to the salvage area, catching glimpses of forklift drivers whose grins seemed to say, there's a new mess waiting for you, and route drivers whose snickers declared, forget about that logo. Maybe it's not too bad, Calvin thought. I can catch up. I can do this. From 20 feet away, after allowing a convoy of forklifts to pass, Calvin caught his first sight of the pile and the logo, just as he had left the night before. He clapped his gloves together and went to work. The pile stood a mere five feet high, except in the middle where Calvin had exposed the logo, three feet deep and ten feet across. This older assortment of refuse emitted a pungent odor, having collected dirt and drippings from years of salvage loads having been dumped upon each other. During the day, he noticed more insects, too, bees and hornets and birds. Calvin had dealt with the situation adequately well during his second week on the job by duct-taping duct to his shirt collar a large orange mesh bag that he'd placed over his head. <laughs> he taped his gloves to his sleeves as well. He had planned his attack on the pile that morning during a lecture on invasive bacteria. It'll be a cinch, he thought, doodling a fully risen Coca-Cola emblem in the margin of his paper. As much as he wanted to expose the full logo and divide the pile in two, he realized he'd work much more efficiently by beginning on one side. I'll start on the high side, he mumbled, close to the bins. The woman sitting next to him in class nudged him and put an index finger to her lips. What if I find a good bottle, Calvin thought. Do I save it anyway? Slow me down? What if I find good product? After laying in there for years, he considered discarding everything to quicken the cleanup, but has decided instead to maintain the work routine and ethic he developed to that point, and to let Mr. Ference and Frank Silva know what product came from the dregs, and to let them decide what was fit for rescue. As he'd anticipated, Calvin threw out more than usual. By five o'clock, having worked nearly half the pile, he'd salvaged only two cases of bottles and a half dozen seemingly benign product. His pace began to slow, too, having to toss that much more broken glass into bins from 30 feet. He also noticed a slope in the floor as he worked toward the center, and rightly guessed that the pile had been placed over a drain. It explained why the floor was no more sloppy or sticky than it would have been without a channel for escaping soda. So he laid a tarp that had been covering a stack of skidded product next to the pile and began pitching his sorted trash onto it, then dragging the tarp to the bins. At that point, too, Calvin shifted sides, working from the other end of the pile. He wanted to savor the climactic moment of revealing the logo and felt that exposing it too soon would distract it or lessen his drive. Stay on pace, he muttered. Work with purpose. Manage the task. Operate efficiently. Attain the goal. With the tarp in place, by 6.30, Calvin had cleared all but the 30 cubic foot area in front of the logo. Passing forklift drivers would pause to watch or take their cigarette breaks next to the salvage area. At that time, too, Calvin had begun to smell a fouler odor and noticed an increasing number of flies having joined the common yellow jackets. He previously uncovered small birds, a few mice, and what might have been a frog during his six weeks on the pile, but the new aroma had a scent of something larger. Instinct told him to get a stick, a long stick, to probe the pile before sorting. As he turned to look for a broom handle, Calvin met the gaze of Frank Silva and three others he didn't recognize. Never thought I'd see the day, Silva said. I think there's a dead animal in there, Calvin remarked. The group began to break up and disappear into the shadows of the warehouse. Be sure to hose down the floor when you're finished, kid, Silva said. That crap's been there for years. 
Another worker added, if it's an animal, it's lost its stink by now. Don't let your imagination get to you, kid. You're thinking too much. Calvin returned with a shovel and prodded at the pile. What the worker had say, said made sense. If what lay in the pile had been dumped with the rest of the trash, it would have fully de decomposed by then. What that meant, though, was that the decay was a product of the drain. Either something living in the drain had died, or something living in the drain had killed its prey in the pile. Calvin considered a raccoon, possum, or rat as likely, before his mind produced twisted images of an emerald-eyed reptile with teeth like broken glass and claws like nails. He stepped back and swatted the flies with his shovel and thought of taking a break. So what if the logo was never uncovered, he thought. But just as immediately he answered, you'll have to clear it out eventually. Life sucks. He looked behind him at the warehouse. Nothing but the faint hums and whirls of machinery and a kind tinkling glass. By eight o'clock, Calvin stood a few feet away from the floor from the floor drain, hosing down the last remains of years worth of syrup, dirt, sawdust, and bug casings. The logo, now fully uncovered, showed signs of deterioration near the floor, its red having flaked away in spots, and the script scabbed over and distorted by years of grime. The creature Calvin had sensed had been a possum, an old possum, judging by its size, no doubt crawled from the drain with its last breaths long before Calvin had started at the bottling works. Calvin had shoveled it into the refuse bin and wondered why he had let his fear of the unknown so overwhelm him. Silva joined Calvin and offered a cigarette. Thanks, I don't smoke, Calvin said. Silva put the lucky strike between his lips. You go to school, right? I'm a freshman at the university, Calvin replied. Silva snorted like I'm impressed. Studying? Calvin smiled. I thought I wanted to get into business, but I'm liking biology, so I may switch. Silva spit a tobacco flake from his mouth. Like there's a future in biology? Calvin blinked. Why did I tell him I, that I've always wanted to be a biologist? That I have little use for business? Why do I care what he thinks of me? You got an hour break, kid. You earned it, too. Good work. After removing the duct tape, gloves, and orange netting, Calvin strode through the warehouse, glancing periodically for anyone who might be watching him. I'm sure the news has gotten around by now, he thought. Calvin, Coca-Cola. Somebody really should get a picture. Calvin, Coke. He walked slowly to the far end of the warehouse, to a quieter place. He must have heard what I did. Why else would work have slowed? Why else but to consider what has occurred? Calvin stood at the base of a conveyor watching a man and woman casually place case after case of empty bottles on the rollers that fed into the production wing of the bottling works. The two uniformed workers took turns shouting their frustrations at the cost of education and how their children didn't appreciate them. A horn sounded in the distance and the two workers stopped and glared at Calvin, who turned to see a lift truck approach with a skid of crated bottles he recognized as the last full pallet he'd filled earlier that afternoon. The driver dropped the skid at the end of the conveyor, tossed a cigarette butt in the opposite direction, and turned ahead toward the other end of the line, as if part of the production continuum. The man and woman lazily placed another case on the line, they too acting in conjunction with a productive mechanical need, like the internal workings of any contraption. The bottles moved up an incline on the motorized conveyor and disappeared into a hole in the wall that led to the production area of the works. Go ahead, take a look, the man said. See what our contribution's all about. This place goes nowhere without us. The woman laughed until she coughed. Calvin took the stairs to the catwalk that followed the conveyor throughout the warehouse and into the production. 
The sound of bottles striking metal in each other, and engines churning, gears grinding, cans fitting, cogs rising with each step. And when he opened the door to the bottling room, he sighed. Cool. Before him lay a maze of conveyors that filled the space with glints of metal and glass. Like little roller coasters, he thought. All was in motion. Large suckered arms dropped from the ceiling to grasp bottles, dangling them thirty feet above the floor. Empty bottles disappeared into cavernous vats of industrial detergent. Bottles turned upside down, dripping in opaque ooze, plunged into another vat for rinsing. Howling ovens swallowed <coughs> moist bottles only to spit them out as glistening miniatures of the idol Calvin had seen in the lobby <coughs> his first day. He followed the procession to the front of the room where serpentine chutes accepted the bottles in single file, winding their way through an array of pipes, tubes, wires, sheet metal, and supports before looping back to the warehouse. Calvin counted only three workers, their gray uniforms in stark contrast to the lime green of the machinery, and each positioned next to an electrical switch box that housed a solitary red button. He watched as the channel of bottles passed beneath utter like spigots that clamped down on the bottle's tops like biting teeth. Fifteen feet down the line, the spigots retracted, revealing a bottle filled with soda. The line then looped to a revolving set of cylinders, like the chamber of a revolver, spinning continually over the bottles that passed below, descending to cap the product. Movable panels segregated the chutes of bottles, like stalls separating livestock and slaughterhouses, each division channeled to a staging area for packaging. I'm a part of this, Calvin thought. He cocked his head slightly as he watched a carton of coke disappear through a hole in the wall on its way back to the warehouse. And he followed. From the corner of the warehouse opposite the salvage area, Calvin noted the path laid out for the delivery trucks, a U-shaped circuit that ran from one overhead door to the opposite end of the warehouse, then along the back side where it turned again, and emptied into Lily Street through another overhead door. Calvin would hear trucks returning during the late afternoon and evening like bees to a hive, but he could only imagine the flurry of activity every morning when the entire swarm lined up to be loaded and sent on their way. Such morning loadings produced the majority of mishaps, improper handling or balance, mixed or faulty orders, non-allocated capacities, and rather than hold up the string of vehicles to correct one truck's variance, that truck would be required, required to circle back through the line for reloading. Open panel trucks dipping out of and into the warehouse at too fast a speed frequently resulted in load shifting and spilling, causing dozens of bottles to burst onto the street pavement most breaking on impact, but some rolling casually into gutters where neighborhood children waited to scoop them up and race to a hiding place in the next block's alley for their soda breakfast. At other times, the more unstable fork trucks spilled their loads while transporting product or materials. The results were similar, though not as much product reached the street. Bottling Works personnel were quick to retrieve any discarded product or waste from the street and transport it to the salvage area to be piled in a heap in front of the old Coca-Cola logo. Still, the scavengers of the neighborhood usually fed first, cued to the street by what seemed an innate sense, an intuition that came from living in the neighborhood and that signaled sweet, available nourishment. One boy, who lived three houses from the northernmost overhead door, boasted he could recognize by the sound of tires when a load was about to spill. <laughs> While Calvin scanned the warehouse expanse, an overhead door opened, admitting both a late afternoon route truck, as well as the sounds of neighborhood children playing hide and seek. Calvin followed the truck initially, but soon found himself drawn to the mixed peals of laughter, discovery, and pain coming from the empty lot across the street. Lit by only an alley light, 
the area revealed more silhouettes than discernible objects. Still, as Calvin approached the door, he sensed the green glass, grass, and leaves in an aroma emitted by the neighborhood. And he watched a ran randomness of motions as various sizes of children darted between bush and fence or house and tree. He leaned against a stack of cased products staged at the next staged for the next morning's distribution at the door's edge, following the gain scene, searching for clarity. Hey, asshole, move it! Calvin recognized Frank Silva's voice as it echoed through the warehouse. Get out of there! Calvin turned. Silva's uniform seemed freshly pressed, its red logo patch so strikingly intense that it momentarily startled him. The supervisor flipped his cigarette into the darkness of the shelves and skids as he quickened his pace toward Calvin. Get the fuck away from that door, he shouted. Calvin straightened himself and let his arms hang limp at his side, a lump forming in his throat. As he licked his lips, he heard a soft scraping noise behind him, and he turned his head in response. A black boy, maybe seven years old, barefooted, and dressed only in a pair of shorts, stood from a squatted position by the door's edge. He ignored Calvin, keeping his eyes on Silva as he reached into the stacked product and withdrew a bottle of Coke. Drop it, nigger, Silva shouted. I know who you are, now drop it. The boy flashed a smile at Calvin, disappearing in the opposite direction of the alley light and into the neighborhood. Silva sneered at Calvin when he drew close to him. Why the hell didn't you stop him? Calvin didn't respond as Silva craned his head out the door. Why didn't I? Calvin thought. After all, I am a part of this, a part of its natural order. I could have raised myself even more in their eyes. Well, he's gone now, Silva said. But I'll see him tomorrow. I'll get him. He'll wish he hadn't messed with us while I'm in charge. Guess I'd better close the damn door. Silver walked toward the door's control box on the opposite side of the opening. Calvin's attention was drawn to the other noises coming from the street, though. A group of children had assembled on the other side, having either witnessed the theft, the confrontation, or the curiosity of life playing itself out in their neighborhood. Calvin watched as the motley collection of children lined up along Curb's imaginary boundary, their eyes reflecting the warehouse lights like pieces of glass catching the sun's rays. Ray stole a coke, the voice shouted. Silva had arrived at the other side of the warehouse and pressed the red close button. The musical cries of the children were drowned by the black overhead door grinding its way slowly toward the floor. Calvin watched the community of children grow as if individuals were drawn by a magnet or perhaps reeled in on a line, as if joined to a common purpose captured in what had just occurred. Calvin let out a deep breath. The overhead door had dropped nearly halfway and Silva had headed back to the bowels of the warehouse when Calvin leaned against the cases of coke, tipping them into Lily Street. The door closed cockeyed, straining against the wooden cases jammed beneath it, and in the distance, a bell sounded. The end. <laughs>